real. <laughs> Norman Dixon. I thought about that man this week. Norman Dixon. That's one of the. Uh, I can't see Peter Place clear. You can't see me clear? If the big um, stripes on the shirt? I said I can't see the face. Why? That's what it is. And I still had to bring it. You can't see him with my glasses. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda McPhil. I'm at the Historic New Orleans Collection. I want to welcome all of y'all. And I'm going to turn the program over to our collaborators at the Neighborhood Story Project. Rachel Brenlin would do, is our moderator for this evening. You want to go ahead and get us started? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks um, to everybody for joining us this evening. My name is Rachel Brenlin. I'm the director of the Neighbor, um, Neighborhood Story Project and a cultural anthropologist at the University of New Orleans. And I'm here with some of my uh, very, very close friends, Charlotte Lewis and Peter Alexander. Charlotte is um, who we call Minnie, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is Ronald's wife and Peter is his long-term friend um, and president of the Big Nine Social and Pleasure Club. And uh, we're sitting in the House of Dance and Feathers in the Lower Ninth Ward and um, our colleague, Mr. Barnes is over in um, the Backstreet Cultural Museum, um, where he is yep. uh, the president <laughs> of the board, as well as the big chief of the Northside Skull and Bone Gang, whose home base is at the Backstreet. Um, so this evening, uh, we're just so happy to be together, even if it's virtual. Um, I, I am here to facilitate the conversation and not talk too much, but I did want to say, um, that this uh, program has emerged from our collaboration with the Historic New Orleans Collections Dancing in the Streets exhibit. Uh, more than a year ago, we began talking about maybe collaborating together and it was when both Ronald and Sylvester were still alive and we had planned to do that together. Um, the Neighborhood Story Project is a collaborative ethnography organization and we have created um, over 20 books um, about the city and culture of the city. Um, <laughs> and Peter's holding up the one that we did with, together with Ronald um, that we published in 2009. And then in um, 2018, we published a book called Fire in the Hole with the Backstreet Cultural Museum. And um, in both of those books, we used a method of collaboration where we work closely with people who are represented in images in the museums to um, tell the stories of the backstreet, the House of Dance and Feathers, but also the cultural traditions of the city. And um, we use the same methods uh, in uh, the Dancing in the Street exhibit in honor of them. Um, for more than 20 years, these places have been um, an orientation center for people from all over the world who want to get to know New Orleans culture. They um, have been a, a way of orientating um, people who are within the culture as well as they've passed on knowledge from generation to generation. And I, I feel extremely blessed to have had the opportunity to work on these book projects with them. Um, I just thought I would begin by reading a little passage from Fire in the Hole. Um, that's from Sylvester. So this is Sylvester's words. And then what I'd like to do is have Bruce talk about um, the origins of the backstreet and um, get into the story of that because it segues really nicely into the story of the House of Dance and Feathers. And then we'll um, hear from Minnie and um, Peter. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're seeing Bruce, um, at the museum right now, and uh, there's Mardi Gras Indian suits everywhere. Um, but Sylvester always said that he didn't sew himself. He said, I think I was born to be a cameraman. In 1970, I started taking movies with Super 8 cameras. Rhodes Funeral Home, where I was working, helped me pay for the film. At the time, you had very few black cameramen, not on Carnival Day. My job was to take pictures, not knowing that you would call it documenting. Truthfully, we're just doing it for us, but people started looking for me. 
once I started shooting jazz funerals, I got the inside scoop and band members started to call me. Hey, we're gonna play tomorrow. My friend coach knew even more musicians than me. Musicians always say to each other, if you die first, I want you to play my funeral. Coach and I used to talk about what kind of funeral that we wanted to. I started exhibiting my work at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. A couple wearing dashikis were looking at my pictures on the wall and the wife walked off. The husband called out, come back, come back. This is a powerhouse of knowledge. Now, me and coach, I'm the dumbest of all. I told him, hey, bro, I'm the powerhouse of knowledge. Coach said, if it wasn't for Velra and me, you wouldn't be making it here. If I told my oldest sister, Elvira, uh, I'm going to fly an airplane, she would ask me for a seat. Coach was like that, too. He believed in me. And really, the whole community of people believed in the backstreet to help it get started. And um, Bruce, I know that you were there um, beginning at the beginnings, witnessing that. I was wondering if you could share some of your reflections. Well, thank you and good evening to everybody. I hope uh, y'all all feeling good on this wonderful spring evening. Uh, I'm sitting in the Backstreet Cultural Museum right here. Yeah, I was uh, good friends with Sylvester and a cross section of different ways. We, uh, we met at a little house party uptown that some university students, probably future anthropologists was having uh, in an apartment right behind where I was living. And, and uh, we were both, we ended up in the kitchen like you do in parties, you know, we were both checking out the scene, trying to figure out what could we eat? And if we wanted to eat something, what it was gonna be. I mean, so you have to understand, it was a bunch of grad students that had through some meals together that we weren't that familiar with. So we, <laughs> not knocking them, but they, you know, they were mostly doing academic, academic stuff, reading a lot. So we went in the kitchen and we started looking for drinks. And, uh, and he asked me if I had anything to drink, like other than wine and beer, I guess. And I said, yeah, I got some, I got some Jack Daniels. So I had brought my drink with me. So he started laughing. He said, you my friend. And so we became friends right there in the kitchen. <laughs> that day we had a little toast and we started talking. And, um, but I had seen him around uh, for quite a while because if you went to a second line or any kind of thing that was in the street going on uh, in New Orleans, you would always see this dude walk right up in the middle of everything. And he was walking around like this. And that was Sylvester. He had his little camera. He would come up and talk to people and do all that stuff. And this is like probably the first little camera I've seen him with in his hand right here. Uh, but he would, you know, shoot people in the end of view them. And we actually would sit at the steps of the back street. It was a hangout spot where people would sit on, in particular, on Friday afternoon. And especially as the first of the month, you know, <laughs> first of the month. So everybody had resources and they had um, things that they liked to share with their friends. <laughs> so <laughs> believe it or not, I would often be in a park rangers uniform, but I, I just started working for New Orleans Jazz Park and Sylvester would be out there holding court on the porch, uh, Lord Lazar, uh, Ray Blasio, the one they called Big Chief Hatchet. Um, they would have people like Ronald Lewis. <laughs> they would have Benny Jones, uh, Lana uh, Baptiste Senior, uh, Big Duck, um, Jerome Smith, a host of people would pass through, men and women. The little lady that played the flute named Lollipop. Mm -hmm. They would all come around, you know, and Sylvester was telling us he was going to start a museum in there. And we would laugh, you know, and go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Vest, make a museum. We're like, what, what you going to make? He said, I'm going to make y'all. You're you going to be in here. So, you know, uh, but in, he had something going on that, that um, we didn't see as clearly as he did. Uh, he had started collecting some items. And in particular, he told us about his dream to start a museum because he had picked up one of his friends, Mardi Gras Indian suit. And you know, the old tradition 
uh, during carnival was when you were done with the suit, you Burn would either up. light it up and burn it or throw it away. And he's seen his friend take off his crown and just throw it by the trash can. And he said, hey, man, you don't want that? And he said, I'm done with it. You can have it. So he picked it up. It was a blue crown. And uh, the suit that this guy was making, he, he, he had just really gotten rolling masking. He took it home and, and stuck the thing in his little open garage and, uh, it, you know, made the garage look pretty. But it was one of those little open garages. So people walking up and down the street or passing by could see it. And, and they started bringing him items. You know, people who started, they, they caught on to the concept quick. So he was also working for um, Rose Funeral Home for John Brown, the Rose family. He was always a hustler with 14 different jobs <laughs> all the time, selling candy, washing cars, you name it. He was doing it. So um, everybody knew that he had started collecting those little items like that from people and people bringing him things like that. So he uh, had talked to Joan about it and she knew that he, he wanted to have something too. And he was, now he's piling up his garage with more stuff than he can handle. So she offered him this space that we're in. And this is the old Blandon funeral home. It was one of the early funeral homes here in the uh, Treme uh, part of town here where uh, people of color, one of the first funeral homes that they had created in the 20th century for themselves back in the uh, late 20s, early 30s. And so in a pretty short order, he started to fill this place up with all of those items after he got it together and created the Backstreet Cultural Museum here. And people were bringing and donating all kinds of things uh, all the time. And he also had by, by that time, he had collected uh, quite a number of, of uh, items. And if you haven't been in here, this place is uh, unique in the sense that it has a ton of Mardi Gras Indian suits in it. It's got baby dolls uh, suits in it. It's got skull and bone suits on one side of the building. And then on the other side, it has um, paraphernalia from social aid and pleasure clubs, benevolent societies and uh, different memorials that people had and several small altars that he built just to honor his friends who had passed away. So it is everything from Chef Austin's um, altar and um, the items that he had given Sylvester on down to Buck the dog <laughs> who had his own second line and, and, and Buck the horse as well. So, um, he really made a connection and in conjunction with all these things that were going on on the inside again people would still come here and hang out on friday make a little toast you know and if they had something going on they would distribute the information uh, and in particular it was all of the uh, different funerals and parades that would happen so they would just basically bring the route sheet by give it to him he was a distribution center for what was happening in the streets of the city, period. So he started the first, really the first full second line season uh, listing all the dates of when everybody was gonna parade, what day they wanted to parade on. Uh, and these are the items that he started to keep and co collect. And he created his own library system, basically. Um, not like the Dewey Decimal System that uh, that man up um, in Philadelphia made, Ben Franklin, but the one that the Backstreet made, Sylvester made down here. And it went according to, for example, not just uh, like uh, names and numbers, but color schemes and things like that. Because a lot of people, for example, in Mardi Gras Indian culture, they, they mask according to color on the annual year. And they use a different color. For example, some folks are pretty sophisticated, like Fayaya, he masked. Uh, and he has a 10 year cycle on his suit. So when he get to the end of that cycle, he comes back to the beginning and the origin of his colors. And, and that's how things are cataloged for that particular group. So he created that library system also. And as I said, he, he had um, 
started to distribute the uh, parade route sheet that now you hear on the radio and places like that. But that was something that people would drop off their route sheet. He collected every route sheet that anybody ever gave him. He collected all of the obituaries that everyone had gave, given him also. And he was shooting um, a lot of film of funerals and processions. So that was something that um, he became synonymous with. And then he started to produce a small booklet, a catalog of all of the folks throughout the years uh, that he had filmed uh, in terms of um, funerals and special events. Uh, and, and he really took his vision. And he expanded it every year and created those things. And some of the other significant things that he did was he started at a annual uh, All Saints Day parade that would memorialize all the folks that had passed away during a particular year. Uh, and starting at Rose Funeral Home on Claiborne Avenue and parading back to the Backstreet Cultural Museum. And so every year he would have a particular person maybe come and do some performance and do different things like, like Ernest Skipper, the guy who uh, known as Shotgun Joe, you know, he has Skipper's record, Coach Collins Lewis, all of the folks like that would help to organize. And then later, of course, the uh, University of New Orleans and the Neighborhood Story Project uh, helping to do that. So, and students come in and he loves students. So he would always pay particular attention to, and you would see him get excited when a little school group of second graders was coming. He would run all over the place um, trying to get the room ready for second graders. So in that concept, he uh, created something called a Louisiana leap test, the backstreet Louisiana leap test, which was a list of questions for students as well as adults about what do you know about culture, uh, cultural events that take place in the city. Like what is a spy boy? What is a flag boy? What are the, the true basic colors of carnival? Uh, so he had a whole list that was his own Louisiana leap test. Uh, and he loved to give that out in the spring because the kids had just finished their leap test. And as a reward, what they would get is they get a, a opportunity to go around the city and go to some of the different museums. And the back street was, was on the list for a lot of people. So you, it would be a busload of kids from Mississippi who had never seen or heard or thought of anything like what they were about to see when they walked through the door. And, um, and he um, always kept those, those events rolling all the time in that concept. Um, when the uh, Albert Morris, who was uh, the big chief of the Northside Skull and Bone Gang, decided he was going to mask and come out of the back street because this is the, the porch that everybody hung out on. Uh, so he tricked me into coming with him. <laughs> I'll never forget it. It was... Uh, initially it was 1999 and uh, I was coming in a little late. I didn't, I didn't mass on Mardi Gras day, but I came in for super Sunday, but he hadn't made my head yet. So 2000, there was a space heater in the back of this. And I mean, the little bitty kind that like, you know, no bigger than this little gas heater. I come over at five o'clock in the morning, all excited. I'm about to mass skeleton. I don't know what I'm doing really but the man is making the head. He hadn't finished anything. And then he paints it. He puts the head on top of the space heater in the back of the room. So he's baking it. The whole house smells like exterior paint. And then he just jammed it on top of my head and told me to get out there and meet the people. And I was like, huh? And he said, you heard me, get out there. And I said, and do what? And he said, you don't worry about that. You get out there and meet him. I said, you're the chief, man. Come on, you're the chief. He said, I'm the chief. And I said, get out there. So, <laughs> so I went out and started mass. Um, well, I did what I could do. Uh, miraculously, I walk out the door. There's about four or five people out there. And I have the flag in my hand. And I just start off down the street. And they followed me. So a few years later, I started, uh, you know, um, after doing it with him solo for a, a few years, um, you know, wanted to have more people in the gang and we did grow it, but everybody would come by. He started having 
uh, maskers come by on Mardi Gras day, uh, you know, by the scores, you know, Indians would stop by, sing songs on the front porch, baby dolls come in, skeletons was here already and hanging out uh, and they would serve food. Uh, WWOZ decided they would broadcast live from the front porch of the back street from Mardi Gras. Uh, and, and, you know, so it, it kept on continuing and then uh, more recent in late years, we uh, started to have 12th night Indian practice here um, that was supported by um, University of New Orleans, National Park Service, and a host of uh, great uh, Indians that would come out and sing, um, as well as um, helping out with the back to school, um, back to school um, aid for children that didn't have backpacks, that didn't have food, that didn't have school supplies and things like that. So that became a part of the legacy of the Backstreet Cultural Museum, as well as photographers um, taking photographs here and, and picking up on some of the concepts that Sylvester had passed along, a lot of what he spoke about and the reason he wanted to even start taking photographs and making pictures was he was in a social aid and pleasure club and somebody took a picture of him and tried to sell him his own picture for like $20. And he thought they were crazy. And he was like, how are you gonna sell me a picture of me? I ain't buying no picture of me. Uh, so it, it prompted him to go and get a camera and start making photographs of people and giving them a photograph, uh, the Polaroid cameras, which he has still has all his old Polaroids are here. So he would take the Instamatic, it was great. It was instant gratification take the photograph, give one to the person, then he would keep one and put it in his museum, uh, the folks there. And so out of Jazz Fest, he started, um, you know, putting up exhibit at Jazz Fest, old school pegboard, put all those pictures on it and, you know, load that stuff in out there. So we would all, this time of year would be nuts right now, uh, beginning of April, because they'd be getting ready for Jazz Fest and all of that whole build out to go out there and, and hang everything uh, for Jazz Fest in that time period. So, you know, I could go on and on about Sylvester Francis, but uh, uh, maybe there, if there are any questions, anything uh, regarding let's, that as well before I go down that rabbit hole too far. Um, let's um, let's hear from Minnie and um, Peter about the House of Dance and Feathers, and then we'll open it up for questions. If sure. That's okay. um, so, uh, I know that we'll probably talk about this in, in terms of Ronald, but um, you know, the Backstreet was a big inspiration for the House of Dance and Feathers. I just wanted to read this little passage from Ronald at the beginning of his book. We were just looking in the museum and Peter found the copy that was like Ronald's copy and we should just show the first page. It says, I don't know if y'all can see it. It says, this is my book, do not touch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Ronald Lewis I know. Because <laughs> um, so many people were always wanting a copy of it. Um, but he says, when you see there's something missing in your community, you want to contribute and make it whole. I thought cultural education was the missing part in the Lower Ninth Ward, and I've worked to create a museum to help fill in this blank. The House of Dance and Feathers has been a fixture in the Lower Ninth Ward since 2003. I've lived there for 30 years and it's always been a central place of being from the time when my boys were growing up with their friends building clubhouses with a yard full of bicycles. Before Hurricane Katrina, the museum, the building was a museum, but it was also a barber shop and the grandchildren's playhouse. So hi, this is Minnie, <laughs> Ronald Lewis's wife. And I helped my husband get the uh, House of Dance and Feather started. Uh, we both worked, and my youngest son, Mass Indian, when he was about 13 or 14 years old, you all added up, he's 42 years old now. So when you come home from work, you have to fix your husband something to eat, make sure your children have everything, and you have feathers flying all around your house <laughs> and beads rolling all over the place. And one day I decided that I had enough feathers and beads flying around, so I took the items that he had and put them in the garage. And that's how he decided that the children in the neighborhood said, dog, Mr. Lewis, this looks like a museum or something. <laughs> he said, so this is what it will be. So he decided that this would be a museum. He had been hanging out around Sylvester for a couple of years and he called Sylvester boss. 
and boss the one inspired him to start the museum after i put everything out he had to do something with it so he just thought like sylvester did all the items that people had from the second lines because ronald was the member of the double nine before he was a member of the big nine he was the president of the double nine then a member of the big nine before his passing so we have all these feathers from the second lines and from the indians and it was really getting to be quite a bit that after katrina people were kind enough to see that this was worth saving because Ronald was trying to teach the children in the neighborhood about the culture of New Orleans and not just the culture of the French quarters. Mm -hmm. And we had to bring the culture down here to them since they weren't going up there to it. A lot of people down in the lower night world, they didn't adventure out all over like Ronald did. Ronald was everywhere and involved in everything. And he wanted everybody to know the things that he knew. So this is how the museum really got started. And people always did come to Lewis. I call him Lewis a lot for advice. Mr. Lewis, such and such and so and so. He would have information where young men can, don't do that. You can go over here and he would get applications for them to go to training schools, to get different little training so that they could get jobs. But as the years grew on, and like I said, when we came back from Katrina and they built this beautiful building, it was students from Kansas University mm -hmm. and the architect was Patrick Rhodes and he designed a special building for Mr. Lewis so that he could put all of his different artifacts in. And as time went on, it grew larger and larger. He not only would have Indian feathers or second line feathers, he had different sculptures and items from different countries. Whereas people come here from different countries and they leave articles for him or they would mail him something back to add to what he had in his museum. He also collected a lot of books because he was into reading a lot and he thought everybody should read a lot. So he had books from for children and for everyone. As a matter of fact, the museum, the, the, the cover of his book was built off of the patch that he made when my son was, like I said, about 14 years old. And this was a patch that Lewis saved when we evacuated for Katrina. While I was getting my clothes together, Ronald was getting photographs, photo albums, and patches. And it's a good thing he bought the patches with him because as time went on, this became his biggest item. This patch is the cover of his book. This patch is the name of his museum. It's about the House of Dance and Feathers. The reason he called it the House of Dance and Feathers because we are speaking about the second line where I say Lewis was the president of the second line, Big Nine. And he also dealt with the Indians. So that's the music and the feathers came together in his head and he decided that it would be called the House of Dance and Feathers. But it was really an educational center for people from all over the world because he learned knowledge. He had knowledge from other people from all over the world. And when people come here, he's able to share what he learned from other people. And as time went on, it just grew bigger and bigger. And he just decided that he would have different type things in here that he would save. He saved things that meant a lot to him. Ronald had things like a pair of shoes that he may have bought in 2000, and 2000. but then a hurricane came in 2005 where Ronald saved some of those shoes because they were like alligator skin shoes. And what was that other shoe y'all wore? Ostrich. Ostrich shoes. $1,300. You know, paid ostrich. that much for a pair of shoes. And I'm like, man, you got to be crazy. But as time went on, it meant something to him. So if it meant something to him, it was all right with me. You know, but I just couldn't see putting on a pair of $1,300 shoes <laughs> at no time <laughs> for no reason, you know, but he said, you only have one life to live. You may as well enjoy, it. you know, just do, treat people good and enjoy your life and try to get them to enjoy life other than their own community. You need to expand your horizons. You may not go to New York or California, but you still can expand your horizons through reading and through knowledge from other people. Mm -hmm. And that's how Ronald decided that he would just spread his love and his knowledge by telling people places he's been or people he's met and share the knowledge with them and hope that they pass it on. But mainly he wanted the community to know that there is some place else other than here in the lower night world. There is life outside of here, but we also want the world to know that the night world is not dead. 
and that we do have something here in the night world. And one of the main things we have here is the Lord Night World House of Dance and Feathers. Mm -hmm. And I'm just proud of my husband and the accomplishments that he made over the years. He was a hardworking man. And like I said, he followed Mr. Sylvester because Mr. Sylvester had the little camera. So Ronald became a little cameraman himself. He had the little camera. So therefore, he had a lot of pictures, a lot of Indians, you know. And as time went on, people wanted to donate some of their Indian costumes or some of their second line feathers or banners or streamers to the museum, which made it larger and larger. Mm. And it's just a joy to be able to say that I was proud of the accomplishments my husband made because he was a hardworking man. He worked for RTA for 31 years. We were married at a young age and we stuck together through thick and thin. And everybody is still waiting. I don't know why for me to have a breakdown or something, but you don't break down when you already know you already had the best you could get. So it's nothing to break down for. It's something to lift up to. It's something to remember and to be thankful for. Not nothing to break down because we all are going to pass at some point in time, you know, and it's just was God's decision that it was Ronald had suffered enough. He had taken sick over the years, but as time went on, he was on dialysis. He had a heart attack. He had a stroke. But at the end of his life, Ronald's second line, Ronald went to the second line parties. Ronald even mass skeleton for the last time. Ronald was honored man of the year in January. So his life was in full bloom. God let him keep on walking his life. Ronald lived a good life. You know, we all are going to have illnesses, but Ronald did not suffer. And so therefore I'm not going to suffer because I saw my husband get up from the stroke. I saw my husband get off of the dialysis machine. I saw my husband survive the heart attack, you know, and my husband was out there dancing like he liked to do and putting on his little makeup of that skeleton outfit on Mardi Gras day, that was the craziest thing. I could never go with him because he would always leave early in the morning. I'm just not an early morning person. I would catch up with him by the Backstreet Museum. I know where he would be at. And I would follow my husband. I didn't go every Mardi Gras to the Backstreet Museum because sometime I got detoured and I wind up on all these Claiborne with my family, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, with my family. I'll just put it, you know, with my family. We have a bird in here. That's okay. He's going to be all right, too. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd rather y'all just ask me some questions about Ronald because yeah. I go off and I go on when I start talking about Ronald, you know, because like I say, Ronald and I have been together since I was 17 years old. And that was more time than I was with my mother, or anybody in my life, mm. you know, so Ronald was the closest person to me in my life. Although I had parents, you know, I didn't live with my parents as long as I lived with Ronald. So Ronald and I grew up together. We knew each other, you know, and mm -hmm. we complimented each other. You want to go this way today, honey, go ahead. I'll see you when I get home, you know, and you just have to let life go, live and let people live. And when they're gone, that don't mean that they're gone from your heart or from your mind, but you have to accept life and death. And I thank God helped me with that because he sold me through all of Katrina when we were separated for Katrina for about two weeks. I called it separated because I missed my sons. I left him mm -hmm. into Atlanta to be with my sons. Ronald stayed here in Thibodeau. We were in a little place called Thibodeau, Louisiana. Well, we couldn't do anything about our house at the time. So Ronald was at the community center helping people to get items that they need. Some people didn't have cars to go from to, to the FEMA place and to the Red Cross. So Ronald took his time helping other people, bringing them places where they needed to get. Because we already know that some kind of way God was gonna help us. We were gonna be all right. When we landed in Thibodeau, soon as we got to Thibodeau, one of Ronald family members, I said, Ronald, why would we go to Thibodeau? We had nowhere else to go. Everybody in our family was gone. So we depended on each other all our lives, you know, and to this day, I'm still dependent and, and living off of Ronald's goodness and kindness, because if he wasn't good to other people, then they wouldn't be good to me. Mm -hmm. And by him being the person he is, that gives me the opportunity to tell somebody else that I know Ronald and I understand why y'all want to talk about Ronald, because I never stopped talking about him. I have pictures all over my living room, all over. I talk to Ronald all the time, you know, <laughs> and I don't be crying. I'll be saying, man, look at this going on. 
what you would have said about these people in these shots, <laughs> you know, yeah. he would have been an advocate for getting the shots, put your mask on, you know, mm -hmm. because we got to try to get rid of this, you know, if we want to see Mardi Gras next year, we have to do this, we have to do that. And a lot of people really look up to Mr. Lewis, you know, and took his advice. And I'm glad they did because they do come back and say, Miss Lewis, I remember when Mr. Lewis did this for me and that for me. I don't remember half of the young people that come back and talk to me about, he said, you don't remember me? I'm the one that remember your husband did? My husband did so much for so many people. And I just be glad and I'll smile and tell him it's glad to see you. And I'm glad whatever my husband said to you inspired your life for you to move forward in a positive direction. And that's the kind of impact Mr. Lewis left on people, positive. So I'm going to stay positive all my life, knowing the life that I had with Mr. Lewis was a great life to say that I started off as a young girl mm. and grow up to be a grown woman where I could sit here and say I was blessed for God to send Ronald into my life. Yeah. Um, Minnie, that, that's beautiful. Do Outstanding. You, um, do you, Peter, do you want to add about what it was like to grow up with Ronald well, as a very close friend? Basically, and... Minnie touched on... Wait, First of all, I'm Peter Alexander, Ronald's mm -hmm. very best friend. Met from more, birth. From birth, more like a brother. We're more brothers than we are best friends. And basically, many touched on a lot of things about Ronald, but the way we were raised and the way we came up was to always reach out and help those who didn't have. From kids, this is what we did. This is what we learned, how to go around and if Miss So-and-so needed something, we'll cut, they cut her grass. Or uh, if we needed to go to the store for Mr. So-and-so, he was sick. This, is, this was our upbringing. And from the beginning, as kids, we always wanted to do something in life to leave our mark. We never knew that this was the thing <laughs> that we was going to do to leave our mark. But as two little boys on Desalon Street that <laughs> always played under the house, because back in the day, houses were raised up off the ground. And when the hot summer, you can cool off by crawling under the house and just chill. <laughs> and this is what him and I used to do. And we would always talk about, you know, we didn't know what it was we wanted to do, but we were gonna do something to leave our mark. And I'm so proud of him because he left a hell of a mark. Yes. And I mean, I don't think anybody can come behind him and, and do it any, better or deeper than what he did. But um, from kids, we got into a lot of things. I was, we was from different sides of the track. I was from the Creole family. He was from the family from the country and we shared a lot of things, you know, different eating habits, different things, different ways. We went to each other's churches. We shared just many things in our life. And, you know, he was like my big brother, and he took me under his wings and showed me a lot of things because he had to become an adult early in life. You know, after his daddy died, and you know, daddy died in the family, they were taught that most of the men step up and start taking, maintaining the family. So he was one that got out, got a job, saw that the family had. And, you know, he took me under his wings and showed me how to, because he was a streetwise person as, as well. And he showed me a lot of things, you know, how to conduct myself in the streets, who not to be with, who to be with, and, and just different things that a father figure would, would teach a, a child coming up under them. He was always a person that wanted to be a teacher, and he always wanted to know about things, how this worked. And that's where I came in. I would tell him, since I went to St. Aug, he went to Carver, I would, he said, well, tell me some of the things y'all do. I said, I'd tell him the different things we do at St. Aug, the type of education that we were getting. And, you know, this really, this really, um, how, what's the word I'm looking for? This is, this really inspired, inspired him. Yeah. Man. To, and basically mm -hmm. that's what he was, a self, he, the majority of stuff that he did, he was self-made. He taught himself. And with my help, I helped him along and he helped me with things I didn't know. And we just took it from there. We uh, we just came through life just learning from each other, really. Like I did. Could you talk a little bit about the Choctaw Hunters? Because y'all started that with Edgar together. Uh, with the Choctaw Hunters, we started that, I think, around in the 90s, around 92, when I made my first suit, my uh the, the colors was fuchsia and um 
we re, by us being out in the streets around the Indians and the second line, we knew Edgar was a spy boy. And we approached that and said, well, hey, look, bro, we thinking about putting together a club, an Indian gang down in the night wall, because at that time, Indians were starting to kind of like fade out in the night wall a little bit after Rudy died of the uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, night wall hunters. Night hunters we kind of, me and Ronald kind of noticed that the culture wasn't as strong as it used to be because, because the culture in the night ward, the Mardi Gras Indian culture was very strong in the night ward. They had about two or three gangs that came out of the night ward. But over the years we noticed, so him and I stood on and said, well, look, let's try to put a gang together in the night ward. So we approached Edgar Jacobs, who was with a gang in the seventh ward running Spy Boy. And uh, we talked to a lot of the guys in the night ward and we say, hey, if you willing to be our chief, we have a gang for you. So that's how the Choctaw Hunters got started. And we had a meeting because I do, I also do, I'm also a licensed cosmetologist. So I had a beauty shop on St. Claude and we had a big meeting over there with all the guys. And from that day forward, we put together the Choctaw Hunters, which was a really nice big gang that came out of the night ward to keep the culture going, to keep it from dying. Because we saw a point where things were starting to die as far as the culture and nobody really was doing nothing about trying to bring it back up. So through that effort, we put together the uh, Choctaw Hunters, the night ward Choctaw Hunter Indian gang. And it was really um, a lot of the same people who also were inspired to start the double nine and then the big nine. Is that right? Well, it was a lot of guys from the uh, from the big from the double nine. Once they dissolved the double nine, I think in ninety around the nine in the nineties, around right. ninety two, something mm -hmm. like that. Once they dissolved them, a lot of the guys got with me and Ronald, and Ronald said, "You know what, Pete? We're gonna start us a new club." And we're not going to have all that chaos and confusion. Mm -hmm. So from there, we got Robert Starks, Edgar Jacobs, and a few of the guys from the Double Nine that we put together, the original Big Nine. Right. And from that day forward, we had no problems, nothing but big <laughs> old fun. Every Sunday, we stepped out in December. Yes. Our parade had gotten so big, we were the second largest parade in the city next to the Young Men Olympia. Correct. The police used to come down and call their friends and say, hey, what's going on uptown? Uh, not much. Well, y'all need to come downtown because it's <laughs> going on down here. Oh, you I know. used to feed the police. Yes, and everybody. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the police used to be able to come get them some red beans and stuff. Yes, so <laughs> it, it protected it, us. It was some major things that we did that uh, pulled this community back together, made this community grow even bigger, put us on the map because... A lot of people thought Night Ward was just country folks and people who didn't know nothing uh, backward, backwards people. But we showed them these were all hard working people that owned everything down here. Nobody hardly rented, people owned their property. We were owners of uh, different properties that, that's, that was in the Night Ward. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was part of Ronald's dream to put us on the map so people wouldn't know we wasn't backwards country folks that didn't know, you know, out the country. We were just as smart as anybody uptown, anybody in the six ward, seven ward, eight ward, throughout the city, we could compete. And, and you know, this was one of his dreams and he made them come true. We both made it come true. Yeah. Um, this has been a wonderful introduction to both uh, Sylvester and Ronald. And I know that we also wanna hear from the people who are listening in this evening. Um, there's a few questions that are in the, the Q&A right now. Um, the, the first one is from uh, Veronica, um, who's asking, did Mr. Francis leave any intentions of what he would like to do with his magnificent archive of um, film and video footage? And then um, there's a question about the Choctaw Hunters after that. Is that and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, is that the call? Uh, um, <laughs> well, the museum is um, is still here, and the film, uh, as well as the items that are here, is you know the plan is to move forward with the museum. You know, this past year has uh, been a roller coaster in every way possible, 
but continuing the legacy of the Backstreet Cultural Museum is is the ideology and the plan that that is um, you know actively being t- uh, taking place and you know planning for the future for it. But the the film that he has quite a bit of it is has been archived in different ways and you know transferred, for example, from uh, celluloid film uh, to a digital format. So advancing the large number of film, films that he created, you know, uh, 500 plus films uh, is, is quite a, a, a task. And that's something that's actively taking place and, and being able to be, have people come back through the doors and enjoy this museum and, and understand and, and see and learn the legacy of uh, what he created out of his head and the cultural knowledge that he has shared here and, and continues to share it. Uh, same thing that Ronald Lewis did. You know, he, uh, I was actually sitting out there with him. He asked me, first, he told me that he was going to be a skeleton. <laughs> so that was pretty interesting. And, and I was like, okay, uh, I was the second chief, you know, but people would often come to me because the chief was tough. <laughs> he just, he was who he was, Albert Morris. And, and he would, talk to people but he didn't fool with people all the time so they they end up coming to me and and then ronald asked me what i thought about him uh like creating somebody i said he, he said he's gonna talk to sylvester he asked me he, you know he was always someone who he had been an organizer in all kinds of ways but he also knew how to uh, solicit information and just get a little light public opinion to poll uh mm-hmm. you know and he asked me what how i thought that would work out if he when I asked him, he was like, I want to do something just like I said, go and talk to him. I think he's going to be happy. I mean, uh, who wouldn't be elated to know that they've done something positive enough that somebody uh, is inspired to do it? So as soon as he asked him, he said, yeah. And um, he did it the smart way. You know, he came over when the toasting was going on and everything, and he was in, the, in that maroon caddy. I, I remember, and, and, uh, and you know, it made it happen. He was all over it, uh, and you know, it wasn't no further questions. It was like this, and and they really changed the landscape of the city as well, mm-hmm. and how people, uh, what people even knew outside of uh, maskers and people that that were on the inside. It gave a perspective uh, that has been modeled, uh, not just in the city, but it's really spread around the globe. So um, there's a question that's um, maybe Peter, you can help with as leading into um, which is someone saying that they'd like to understand the difference between Mardi Gras Indians and second lines and maybe and then um, Karen is asking if the Choctaw hunters are still continuing. Well, yes, to the uh, is, is the Choctaw hunters continuing, I would say yes, because right now. I'm working on a suit to bring the name of the gang back for 2022. Matter of fact, Ronald and myself, we were working on a plan to bring the gang back in 2022. But unfortunately, he left me with the with the big picture. So yeah, we're going to bring it back. And uh, Choctaw Hunters are, to me, very much still alive, even if it's just me, myself, that is Choctaw Hunters. Mm. Because I at, at this time, I am the chief. Um, and if for people who don't know, maybe never have been um, to a carnival in uh, Black communities around the city, could you just explain how Mardi Gras Indians are different than social and pleasure clubs? Mardi Gras Indian is different than social aid and pleasure club because in the beginning, Mardi Gras Indian was just, uh, how can I put it, an unorganized group at that time, I mean, Mardi Gras Indian didn't have no special route. Unlike uh, second line clubs, you have a route to follow. Indians, you just caught Indians where you can catch them. And this is how they went over the years. They never, I mean, as far as them being together as a gang, yeah, but as far as anything else, uh, with what was a control system, no, the, the uh, Mardi Gras Indians were never under a control system. They went where they wanted to go and they did what they wanted to do at that time. Unlike second line clubs, you have to follow guidelines and times. regulations, times and rules and stuff like that. 
Um, there's a question about the um, whether the HNOC is part uh, going to plans to partner with the House of Dance and Feathers in the back street. Um, and maybe Amanda can talk a bit more about this, but uh, just to, you know, they they have partnered with them on the Dancing in the Streets exhibit. That's, you know, how we've come together. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, Ronald um, and the, one of the curators chose the objects that's um, on display right now at the oh, museum. Okay. And um, we, um, Bruce and I worked uh, with the curators to ch choose some th complimentary things from the back street. So you can actually see some of the collections on display right now. And then we've also um, been working with 29 social and pleasure clubs on um, a publication of oral histories that we're using the same methods that we used with both of the museums, which is that we co-edit. So nothing is getting published without the co-creation with the clubs. And that was um, based on the ethics of how the museums were run. The museums always, just like Bruce was saying, you know, you ask before you do before something. You, you right, don't just right. go and do something and say, oh, well, I thought it was OK. Um, and you know, Ronald and Sylvester were both you know, very gracious in their own communities about making sure that um, people knew what was going on with the things that they donated. Um, and um, the HNOC has been a wonderful partner in helping us imagine that for dancing in the streets. Because the museum is a living thing. Mm -hmm. the, the both of the museums, this is our lives. This is our everyday life. And, you know, the museum is always alive because of us, the Mardi Gras Indians and the second liners and the things we bring and donate. This is our life. So that's mm -hmm. why you have to ask permission. Can we just, can we do this and can we do that? Because other than that, it would be considered stealing. <laughs> and it's a great cultural exchange over the world because people come from all over the world to Mardi Gras. And a lot of people come to the Backstreet Museum for Mardi Gras from all over the world. Yes, so it's a, it's a across the world. It's not just across the bridge type thing. And here in the um, Little Night Walk by the House of Dancing Feathers, where Ronald also exhibits at the jazz festival yearly. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he gets to meet a lot of people at the jazz festival where he could bring some articles from the House of Dance and Feathers and that would interest people to make them come to the House of Dance and Feathers at a later date. Because during the jazz fest, you can't visit the House of Dance and Fest Feathers because he's at the jazz festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those same people that may have come in for Mardi Gras, they will come back in the springtime oh, or some yes. other time to visit the House of Dance and Feathers. Oh, yes. You know, and a lot of time people that went to the Backstreet Museum, Sylvester would suggest to them to come visit the House, House of Dance, of Dance and Feathers and, yep. and Lower Night War. So mm -hmm. therefore, they collaborated with people all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they were, they're never in the same place at the same time these days, because Ronald is running the House of Dancing Feathers, Sylvester got the Backstreet Museum going on, but they have the crossing of the people mm -hmm. that will come from the House of Dancing Feathers, go to the Backstreet Museum. One thing I can say about... Well, well the, sorry to cut in, but they were asking the question from a man and we never got to it, so... <laughs> uh, uh, I just wanted to just jump in real quick <laughs> Go to, ahead, say, <laughs> to say that we've you know, been so happy to be working with all of y'all with Sorry the House of Dance and Feathers and the Backstreet Culture Museum and the Neighborhood Story Project on this exhibition. And I don't think this was mentioned yet, but actually the exhibition is dedicated to Ronald Lewis and Sylvester Francis. So when you walk into the exhibition, you'll see their photos and their bios right at the front with the dedication saying that, you know, this exhibition would not be what it was if not for the work that they did and what they have contributed to this city. So that was, you know, we want to keep working with y'all going forward, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that, you know, we are celebrating them in the exhibition as well. So, yeah, I'll, I'll let y'all keep going with the Q&A. Um, no. Mini, do you guys want to talk about whether you're um, like what this next step is for the House of Dance and Feathers too. I know people are interested well, in- Well, we know we can't make any steps until T to say we can. <laughs> 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 T 
tell them who TD is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to wait till, uh, till <laughs> the, the mayor, mayor. Yeah. says it's okay <laughs> for us to open up. But we're willing and ready to open up. We're willing to have people come back. Yes. But we have to be safe in this time and days yes. right now. We've had our shots, but what about the other people? And we want to make sure that everyone is safe. The museum will be here, you know. And when everything is safe, I'm welcoming people to come. I want people to come. I wish I could give them my number, but I don't know if that would work at this time. Mm -hmm. But the House of Dance and Feathers will reopen. Mm -hmm. I will be in charge of it with the help of anybody that's willing to help me. I'm taking orders <laughs> and asking for assistance you know because how. I probably will need it because mm -hmm. I could never replace Rommel, but I could at least follow his steps. And you know, I'll be here periodically because this is where I spent the majority of my time when Ronald was alive, right back here in the House of Dance and Feathers. So or in the see kitchen. Me. Or in the kitchen. <laughs> or in the kitchen getting something to eat. <laughs> That's naturally New Orleans. There's yeah, a, but we plan on opening up. up. Um, there's a question from Freddie Hill. Uh, will the House of Dance and Feathers in the back street include other culture bearers such as baby dolls and the Northside Skull and Bone Gang? I, I know both uh, both museums do include some exhibits of both of those, but maybe right. y'all could speak a little bit on that. Yes, we do have uh, other cultures in here. We have all um, well, other clubs well, and things. We the only thing we don't have, uh, maybe Ronald has something in here I'm not aware yeah. of with the baby dolls, but do. he already had things in with the, the annex. Um, in the annex oh, think. yes, I forgot there's another annex. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, I haven't been in that one. We have things from the Zulu King and Queen in one of the annexes uh, from Zulu. Uh, baby dolls, yes. And I think do. we do have baby dolls. We have muses. We have shoes from muses. So everybody's pretty much included. Nobody's excluded. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And we'll keep it going like that. Whoever want to be a part of it, it's not just for the night ward. It's, it's for, the, for world. the world. It's for the whole city. So come on through, y'all. We, you know, we're we here. You. We here. Come through. And Ronald here too. <laughs> Believe right. that. Bruce, did you want to add anything about the Backstreet? Uh, well, yes. You know, the Backstreet Cultural Museum is... Um, it has a variety of uh, things, not just the uh, suits that you see behind me. They are certainly one of those favorite features, but there's a whole, uh, there's a section in here uh, dedicated to uh, baby dolls, to, um, for example, the suits uh, from Mr. Ashton Ramsey that he creates and makes every year. Uh, uh, this is the home of the Northside Skull and Bone Gang. Uh, we have our skeleton altar here. Um, and there are a variety of items in here. Then there's another whole room that has Social Aid and Pleasure Club, um, <clears throat> all sorts of paraphernalia, umbrellas, baskets, shoes, pants, shirts, suspenders, socks, mm -hmm. uh, hats, handkerchiefs, uh, streamers, you name it. Um, it. It's in here. And then a lot of um, photographs that people have uh, also donated from photographers, um, and as I said, altars, you know, there's a lot of memorabilia in this uh, particular space. And, um, and there's a lot more, but that's not here, just what they're saying also. Um, so yes, it's here and, and the continuation and growth is uh, a part of what uh, is. We even have stuff from Ghana there's and a, Africa. Um, there's a question about find the books and you can um, buy them directly from the Neighborhood Story Project's website, um, which is just neighborhoodstoryproject.org and we profit share. Uh, and Ronald and I have been, and now Minnie, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've been business partners for a long time um, and it supports the Neighborhood Story Project as well as the museums um, to be able to purchase directly from us rather than through um, Amazon. But you could also purchase it at the House um, the Historic New Orleans Collection has the books right now. So if you are interested in seeing the exhibit, um, that would be a way to, to get the book as well. Um, we, it seems like we are at the time. Um, we also have books here at the House of Dance and Feathers well, yeah, yeah, that's that for, can be purchased. Mm -hmm. So when, when um, they're back open, when that, would back be, open that would be the number ready. one place to get them yeah, he's yeah. That and you, can, you can do the same here at the back mm -hmm. street we have uh we have the books here yeah 
Um, well, thank you so much to everybody for a beautiful evening. Thanks so much for um, joining us, Mr. Barnes over in the uh, back street and Amanda. So you're right. Thank you so much for helping us organize it. Thank Me you, Amanda. And Peter. I want to thank you all for being interested in our lives. Yeah, thanks. Because this is our life that we're talking about when we talk about the back street museum and the house of dancing feathers. And we want to continue to let these lives continue to grow and for other people to learn more and more about the people here in New Orleans. Yes, we do. All the time. Yes. Big thank you to the uh, HNOC for organizing their course and good to see everybody's face, first of all, and second of all as well. Yeah. You're like a ray of sunshine. <laughs> all right. Thank y'all thank all spring. so much too. It's been such a wonderful evening. Thank y'all for being here and for sharing your stories and your memories with us. This has been, I'm seeing the comments. People um, have been really touched by the the talk y'all gave tonight. So thank y'all again for this. All right. So you. glad we could be a part of it, Amanda. Anytime we thank bring you. Here. Let's do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. <All right>. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Amis. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank y'all for joining us this evening. We'll Thanks. see y'all soon. All okay. right. Bye. Au revoir. Oh, that didn't take no time. That was nice.